Good morning, friends. I'm here to read chapter 19, The Bakery. And we'll see what we can find out, whatever uh, might happen in the bakery today. Where? The others cried, and were making a dash for the window when Antonius warned them back. Keep down so he won't see you. They ducked down on the floor, crawled to the window, and peered cautiously over the sill. Xantippus, too, hugging the wall, had made his way to the window. Where do you see him? he asked. Over there, Antonius whispered. <clears throat> on the other side of the street, a short, fat man was walking rapidly in the direction of the forum. He was wearing a cloak with a hood, which he had drawn over his head. How do you know he is Tellus? Musius asked in a low voice. I recognized him right away, Antonius said. His hood blew off for a moment, and I saw his bald, bald head and a scar. I swear it's him. He glanced over here, too, but he didn't see me. Probably he's going to visit Lucos, Xantippus murmured. But Tellus walked past Lucos's house and stopped three houses further down the street in front of a bakery. He turned around, took a long look at the Xantho school, and then vanished inside the baker's shop. He's gone to buy some rolls, Flavius exclaimed in amazement. Xantippus hobbled to his bed, sat down on it, and began rubbing his leg. In straightening up from the floor, he had moved too quickly and hurt himself again. The boys gathered around in concern, but the pain seemed to ease up. When their teach then their teacher gave them his verdict. A millionaire does not go out to buy himself self rolls, he said. In fact, he hardly goes anywhere without his slaves and hangers-on. All of this is very suspicious. Perhaps Tellus had discovered the disappearance of the cloak and chain, and he is going to confer with someone, somebody there. Meeting the red wolf, Antonius exclaimed. Xantippus shrugged. Whoever it is, it would be interesting to find out what he is doing here. I'll run over and look, Musius suggested. No, Xantippus said. It would be dangerous for you to go alone. A cornered criminal will stop at nothing. It is better for you to all go together. When there are six of you, you are much safer. But stick together all the time and be careful. If you are threatened, get out. I don't want any foolish hero heroism. <clears throat> Musius, Antonius, Caius, and Julius ran off wild with enthusiasm. Publius followed them with a mocking expression. He thought nothing would come of this whole undertaking. As usual, Flavius brought up the rear. The cloudburst had turned the roadway into a rushing stream. The boys hopped across by way of the raised blocks of stone which were placed on the roadways at regular intervals, making a bridge from one sidewalk to the other for the use of pedestrians during just such storms as this. They raced down the sidewalk and charged into the bakery like the Persians into the path at Thermoplay. The baker who was busy kneading some dough in a trough beside his oven, looked up in astonishment. Hey, have you kids gone crazy? He asked good-naturedly. Are you planning to conquer Carthage for a second time or a school out? He knew the boys well, for they were good customers of this. They always came around during the breakfast recess and brought, bought piles of rolls and stacks of cookies. Tellus was nowhere in sight. The boys all... Over the shop, went all over the shop looking for him while the baker watched them in wonder. Whatever became of that short fat man who was in here a while ago, the one in the hooded cloak? Musius asked. The baker laughed. Oh, him, he replied, pointing to a door at the back of the shop. He just went through there. Why? What is he doing there? Julius and Musius burst out. He's a queer bird, he is, the baker said. He pulled the dough free from his arms and hands, tossed it back into the trough, and began kneading it again comes through here three or four times a week. Comes in the front door, goes out the back. Why? The boys chorused. The baker shrugged. Jupiter knows, he said indifferently. And that's all you know about him? Musius pressed. Absolutely, the baker assured. I don't ask him any questions. What do I care anyway? He pays me a hundred sisters a month for the right to go through. I bet if he counted up his money, he'd have more than all the rolls I baked in my in all of my life. Once I made a mistake and asked him, hey, you in the hood, where in the world do you go? And do you know what he did? He drew, he up and drew a sword from under his cloak, glared at me like a, the hellhound Cerebus, and said, if you value your life, don't think about it. Since then, I haven't thought about it. I do value my life, even though I have to wear myself out earning a living. I have a family to support, and a hundred sisters a month isn't chicken feed. 
The boys stared back at the door. When does he come back? Julius asked. Back? The baker repeated. By Pluto, he never comes back. He comes in the front, goes out the rear, but never returns. Musius went slowly to the back door. Where does this lead to? He asked. Nowhere, the baker replied. That's the end of the store. There must be something, Musius said, pushing the door open slightly. You better not stick your head out, the baker called to him. First thing you know, he'll chop it off with a sword of his, that sword of his. But Musius showed no sign of fear. He opened the door further, leaned forward, and looked out to both sides. The others came up behind him and squeezed into the doorway, trying to see also. Before them, in the gray twilight, lay a bare courtyard. About 10 or 12 yards away rose a high wall. Beyond that must be the field of Mars, for over the top of the wall they could see the crowns of the cy cypress trees swaying in the wind. On their right wall of the next building projected so that they could not see where the, car where the yard ended. We ought to have a look around that corner at any rate, Musius said. No harm in that, Julius murmured. Come on, Musius said. They pulled their togas up to cover their heads and stepped out into the rain. Peering around the projecting wall, they saw that the yard extended as far as a high, massive building that stood at an angle to the other houses. There was no one in sight. The boys boldly pressed forward. They stayed close to the walls of the building, paying no attention to the deep puddles. Where could tell us to vanish to? The low houses adjoining the bakery had neither doors nor windows in the rear. Tellus could not have entered any of them. But then they came to a tower-like building made of heavy stone, square stones reaching high above the one- and two-story shops. The boys realized at once this was Luco's house. To the left of it was the massive edifice of the Baths of Diana, the only other building around here of the same height. Between the two buildings yawned a narrow, dark gully. From Lucos's house, a rectangle spot of light fell across the space and upon the wall of the Baths of Diana. There's a door open in Lucos's house, Julius said softly. Wait, Antonius whispered, and he crawled forward on his hands and knees as far as the edge of the splash of light. Then he flattened out onto his belly and squinted over the threshold. He withdrew his head hastily and crawled back to backwards toward them. Tell us it's in there, he reported. What is he doing, Musius asked. Nothing. Where's Lucos? Flavius asked anxiously. I don't, didn't see him, Antonius replied. Well, what was the next step? If the boys crossed in front of the door, Tellus would certainly see them. Then he stared indecisively into the dark gully, not daring to go forward and unwilling to go back. Then they noticed several thin rays of light in the wall about halfway between their observation post and the door. Musius crept over to this light. Then he beckoned the others to follow him, but he held a warning finger to his mouth. The light came from a window over which the heavy boards had been nailed. The, there were cracks between the boards and the boys pressed their faces against the wet wood and peered through. The window was also protected with iron bars, but they could see directly into the big vaulted room in which they had been received by Lucos. It was darker than it had been when they last saw it, for there was no fire in the fireplace and the horrible masks on the pillars were not lit up either. A dim lantern was burning on the table at which Lucos had sat. The ceiling and the distant corners of the room were shrouded in dense shadows. On the table, the boy spotted a basket of snakes, but it was covered with a cloth. Next to it lay a short sword with a wide blade. Tellus was sitting on a hassock, wiping the rain from his face. His cloak lay on the floor beside him. He seemed to be waiting for something. For now and then he tilted his head to one side and listened attentively. He's waiting for Lucos, Flavius breathed. But suddenly Tellus jumped up, crossed the vaulted room rapidly, and vanished behind a curtain which hung across a niche in one wall. There's another room, Caius said. Lucos is probably in there, Musius declared. Or the red wolf, Antonius said. If only we could hear what they were saying, Musius said impatiently. But Tellus and Lucos remained <clears throat> behind the curtain. The boys could hear someone talking, but could not make out the words. I'll sneak over to the door and listen, Musius said. I'm coming too, Caius volunteered. So am I, Antonius said. Xantippus told us to keep together, Flavius complained. All right then, Musius said. Well, I'll go. Take off your sandals. If we make the slightest noise, we're done for it. Sit close behind me. If I call, watch out. We all make a dash for it. Through the bakery, remember. They slipped their sandals off, made a small heap of them next to the wall, and stole up to the door. For a while, they stared into the vaulted room. It remained empty, and Musius led, 
led the way across the threshold. He walked on tiptoe, placing one foot ahead of the other very slowly, balancing himself with his arms. Every so often he paused and stood motionless, listening. The others followed his example. At last they had reached the curtain and remained standing in front of it, holding their breath. From behind it they could hear a mysterious tinkling metallic sound, a hoarse voice murmuring, 100, 200, 300. Musius moved the curtain aside ever so slightly and forced himself or found himself looking into a cellar-like chamber. The windowless stone walls glistened with dampness. On a small table stood a flickering candle that had almost burned down. Tellus was nowhere in sight, but Luca sat with his back to the curtain. Musius recognized him at once by his long, dirty yellow hair and the black cloak and the silver stars sewn on it. The soothsayer was busy counting heaps of gold pieces, which were stacked up on the table. After he finished with each stack, he pushed it into a bag. He was completely absorbed in what he was doing and went on murmuring, 400, 500, 600, but suddenly he stopped and whirled around toward the curtain. His face was not painted black and white this time. Instead, he wore a clay mask tied over his face with a kind worn by actors on the stage. For a while, he stared fixedly stared fixedly at the curtain, then jumped to his feet. Frightened, Musius let go of the curtain. Watch out! Let's run! He whispered sharply. Flavius was the fir first to move. He shot toward the door as if he had been catapulted, but he tripped over a tight string stretched across the floor and fell forward to his, on his face. Immediately, the back door banged shut. The boys threw themselves against it in despair, tugging and pulling, but in vain. Don't bother, a hoarse voice said. You won't get it op open. Lucos had drawn the curtain aside and confronted the boys. They could see his eyes glittering evilly behind the clay mask. With clumsy footsteps, he slowly approached them, and the boys instinctively moved close together, closer together. Flavius was still stretched out on the floor, not moving. Either he was paralyzed by fright or playing dead. Lucos went up to the fallen Flavius, stooped with a groan, and pulled the boy up by the hair. Help! Flavius screamed piercingly. He sprang to his feet like a flash and fled toward his friends. Lucos gave a short laugh. Then he sat down on the hassock, folded his arms, and said menacingly, I knew you were coming. You fell into the trap. This time you won't escape me. If you do anything to us, I'll tell my father, Caius said. You'll never have the opportunity to tell your father anything again, Lucos replied. A chilled silence followed. Finally, Musius cleared his throat and said somewhat hoarsely, <clears throat> We don't want any trouble with you. We saw Tellus going in here. Tellus is not here, Lucos said sharply. Isn't he in there? Musius ventured, pointing to the curtain. Tellus has gone home, Lucos said. A door in there leads to the side street. But his cloak is lying there, Julius said. For a moment, Lucos stared at the cloak lying beside the hassock. Then he croaked. He was in a hurry to get home. Let us go home too, Flavius cried in a shaky voice. Oh no, Lucas said. You have no right to keep us here, Julius said defiantly. You have no right to come spying around here, Lucas replied mockingly. People who pry into dangerous places must expect unpleasantness. We are not afraid. We are Romans, Musius said heroically. Bravo, my son, Lucas chuckled. You have no need to be afraid. I'm not going to hurt you. That sounded like a, a good deal pleasanter, and the boys breathed easier. Perhaps Lucos was not as bad as he pretended to be. You mustn't put a spell on us either, Antonius said. I know a lot better wizard than you. He'd take the spell up right away. I do not bother with enchantments, Lucos said tartly. I can only see things that are hidden from other people. That is how I, knew, I know why you are here. You are looking for the desecrator of the temple. You think he is Tellus. And the boys were taken aback. Lucos not only had second sight, he could even read thoughts. Musius nodded assent. We don't know for sure that it is Tellus, but we suspect him. Perhaps it is the Red Wolf. Do you happen to know who the Red Wolf is? Lucos sat as though stunned for a moment. Then he suddenly jumped to his feet, waved his arms wildly, and screeched in a fury. There is no Red Wolf. Tellus is innocent. I am the desecrator of the temple. I alone. Wow. There's someone else that's uh, confessing. Well, I don't know if it's really him or not. So chapter 20 
is called Surprises. So we'll see what surprises lay in store for us in Detectives and Toga. We have um, 20 and then we have two more chapters after that. All right, I'll see you soon. Have a wonderfully blessed Easter weekend. Um, I miss you all and hope we can see each other soon.